everybody. My name is uh, Jeff Moulter. I am a CRNA and I'm with Block Buddy Pro. Today I'm going to be talking to you about the interscaling nerve block. Scott Griegel and I teach a lot of ultrasound guided nerve block courses and it seems that the interscaling nerve block is the most intimidating to most people. I'm not exactly sure why. I don't know if it's because of the different anatomical structures in the neck, but I will say that the block is really not that difficult. Today we're going to talk about some relevant anatomy. I will cover the equipment and I will go over the procedure with you and also talk about some possible side effects and complications. I'm hoping that after this video you'll feel a little bit more confident in your approach to the interscaling nerve block. If you think of any questions after viewing this video, don't hesitate to reach out to me. My email is very simple. It is jeff at myblockbuddy.com. Just wanted to disclose my potential conflicts of interest. I am part owner of the Block Buddy Pro and the Block Buddy apps. Uh, if you want more information about the Block Buddy app, please go to myblockbuddy.com. I would like to say that it is an awesome app, and it's basically a reference book in the uh, that you can carry around in your pocket. Uh, it is accessible on your any type of mobile device iPads, computers, uh, any type of device that uh, you could think of, uh, Block Buddy is accessible. When I uh, was doing blocks before, I used to always carry around a stack of books with me to all the various facilities I went to, but it's been phenomenal in the last four years. I haven't had to carry these books around with me just because I have the Block Buddy Pro app. So uh, just a little plug out to Block Buddy and Block Buddy Pro, and I want to thank Scott Uregel for allowing me to uh, share a lot of the uh, videos and uh, illustrations from Block Buddy Pro. So what types of procedures do interscaling blocks work for? Well, pretty much any type of procedure of the shoulder. Uh, those would include rotator cuff repairs, open or closed rotator cuff repairs, shoulder manipulations, uh, shoulder arthroplasty, a shoulder arthroscopy, a distal clavicle repair, a slap repair, and also for proximal humeral fractures. Those are all uh, great procedures where an interscaling block uh, works great for uh, post-operative pain control. Now, as far as the clavicle, the distal clavicle uh, is covered with an interscaling block, but the mid-clavicle and the skin over the mid-clavicle would not be covered by an interscaling nerve block. So if you had a patient that is going to have an open reduction or a clavicle repair, you would need to add a intermediate cervical plexus block to your interscaling nerve block in order to get complete coverage of that clavicle and shoulder. I also wanted to add that C5, C6, and C7 are the targets of the interscaling nerve block and note that C8 and T1 are spared. The interscaling block is not indicated for surgical procedures of the elbow down to the hand. So you can see the dermatome coverage here and notice the medial side of the arm and the hand are not covered with an interscal interscaling nerve block. So that's the dermatome coverage. Uh, here is an illustration of the muscles or the myotomes covered by an interscaling nerve block. And uh, last but not least, we have the osteotomes that are covered by the interscaling nerve block. Well, the equipment needed to perform an interscaling nerve block, first we're going to need a needle. So we prefer to use a 50 millimeter 22 gauge stimulating echogenic needle. Um, the type that we use at our facility are the Pion brand needles. Um, we feel that they're high quality and do a nice job. Next, when we're doing ours, we use the uh, dual guidance technique. So we actually do use a nerve stimulator with an EKG patch. Uh, we do that in combination with our ultrasound. Um, we feel that this is uh, the safest way to perform an interscaling nerve block. Uh, that peripheral nerve stimulator um, acts as an, as an extra margin of safety when you're um, stimulating the uh, nerves of the brachial plexus. Uh, next, you're going to need 15 to 20 milliliters of local anesthetic. 
I would say um, my preference is I use I actually use half percent Narapin. I'll take a 30 um, cc vial and I'll add uh, 10 milligrams of preservative free Decadron in the 30 cc's and then I'll draw up three 10 cc syringes and I'll usually use 15 to 20 milliliters of the local anesthetic. Um, if I'm having trouble, I'm having issues, then I'll have that extra syringe as a backup to add additional local anesthetic if I need to. Uh, I would say that uh, Scott uses a little bit lower concentration of Narapin. He uses 0.375% Narapin. He also uses 15 to 20 milliliters of local anesthetic. Next, we're going to need a um, high frequency linear probe. Uh, this is from Sonosite. It is 6 to 13 megahertz. And notice it has a, a small footprint, which just makes manipulating the probe in the neck area a lot easier. So you're definitely going to want to use a high frequency probe because you'll get the best image quality and the best resolution when you're using a high frequency probe. Next, we're going to use a, a skin disinfectant. So we have these little three, mil, three milliliter applicators that are chlor prep. So we use these to uh, prep the skin. Very affordable. I believe that's under a dollar. Uh, also, we're going to use sterile gel. So these little aquasonics come in these little containers. Those are very uh, affordable also. We're also going to use, of course, sterile gloves. And last but not least, we're going to use a sterile probe cover. And we have two choices. We have a, a safer sonic uh, probe cover. And the Safer Sonic probe cover is kind of like a sandwich baggie, so it lets you cover the head of the probe and go down the cable a little bit more. Uh, and then there's a, here's the one that I really like to use. Um, it's made by a company named Sheaths. But it's basically almost like a tegaderm, and you'll see it in my video where we're basically just putting it over the, uh, the head of the ultrasound probe. So... That's the equipment that we'll need when we're performing a ultrasound guided uh, nerves. I'm sorry, an ultrasound guided interscaling nerve block. I wanted to show you this uh, brief video for anatomical reasons. Uh, it's a virtual cadaver. This is an app that you could download on your iPad. It's called Complete Anatomy. It's from El Sevier, but essentially. We have our virtual cadaver here, and we're going to be focusing in on the uh, brachial plexus on the right side of the patient. Peel away the skin, and we can see here's the clavicle, and here's the subclavian artery, which is going to be a landmark for us when we're scanning our patients. We also see that the subclavian artery passes over the first rib, and then goes under the clavicle in this region here. I'm also highlighting here the different trunks of the brachial plexus. Notice that the brachial plexus is superior and lateral to the subclavian artery just above the clavicle. Again, that's going to be our starting point when we're doing our scanning. We're then going to be taking our probe and scanning up the patient's neck until we see C5, C6, and C7 in this interscaling region. Now the brachial plexus is formed by the anterior rami of nerve roots C5 through T1. Now nerve roots C8 through T1 can be located deeper in the neck and not reliably blocked with this approach to the brachial plexus. The supraclavicular nerves of the cervical plexus are indirectly blocked from the spread of local anesthetic out of the interscaling groove. These branches supply the superior aspect of the shoulder. Now the phrenic nerve lies over the anterior surface of the anterior scaling muscle and it may be inadvertently blocked and we'll see when I start um, putting the different muscle layers here you're going to see how that phrenic nerve passes over that anterior scaling muscle and moves away from the brachial plexus as we travel down the neck.
Again, just getting a view of the nerves of the brachial plexus here, the position of the phrenic nerve in relation to the brachial plexus. You can see how the um, scaling muscles are here. You've got the middle and anterior scaling muscles. And again, notice how that phrenic nerve passes on top of the anterior scaling muscle and it moves away from the brachial plexus. You can see this RTDCB. This is so that we can remember the brachial plexus. Um, going from medial to lateral, we have roots, trunks, divisions, cords, and branches. And one easy way of remembering this, I learned this from a student, Randy Travis drinks cold beers, roots, trunks, divisions, cords, and branches. As we go from uh, more central to more lateral, moving down uh, the brachial plexus. Again, we're just going to review the anatomy here. This drawing is from uh, Block Buddy Pro and wanted to focus in on this area here. Again, just below the clavicle, we have the uh, subclavian artery. And as we go above the clavicle, we notice how the nerves of the brachial plexus are superior and lateral to the subclavian artery. And as we slide up the neck, we're going to see those nerves come together in what looks like a snowman or a stoplight. Also, again, notice the phrenic nerve here how it passes over that anterior scaling muscle. And as we travel down the neck, that phrenic nerve moves away from the brachial plexus. Now, when we're scanning the patients, we're going to want to position the patient comfortably. We're going to have the head of the bed up 45 degrees, which will uh, decrease uh, venous engorgement. It's also going to make the patient more comfortable. We're going to have the patient turn their head away from us, which will kind of stretch out the neck a little bit. Now, if we're on the patient's right side, we're going to have the probe in our right hand, and we're going to bring the needle in with our left hand from the lateral side. We're going to uh, have the pillow here. Move the pillow over in this direction so that you have space behind the patient's head. So when you're bringing your needle in with your left hand from the lateral side, you have more room to work with. Just to be ergonomic, we're going to be standing right across from our ultrasound machine, so that we could see everything perfect and everything is perfectly lined up. So if we're on the patient's right side for an interscaling block, we typically put the probe in the right hand and the needle in the left hand. If we were to switch to the patient's left side, we would move this monitor over here. And of course, we would switch hands. We need to be ambidextrous. We'd put the ultrasound probe in our left hand and we'd bring the needle in with our right hand coming from the lateral side. We first apply that probe above the patient's clavicle. We're going to position it just superior to the clavicle. We're going to kind of aim this ultrasound beam down towards the patient's toes. So put the probe up against the patient's skin and then just tilt the probe so that the beam is un aiming underneath the clavicle. When you do this, what we're looking for is this big anechoic or black circle that's pulsating. We're looking for the subclavian artery. When you first put the probe above the patient's clavicle and you scan down, you may have to slide this probe medial and lateral, medial and lateral a few times while you're looking at the screen until you can locate this pulsating subclavian artery. It's anechoic black circle. You're going to see a very hyperechoic white line underneath that. That is the first rib of the patient. The left side here is lateral, the right side is medial. Once we see that subclavian artery pulsating, we're going to look superior and lateral. We're going to see this little bundle of grapes, multiple little anechoic black circles uh, with little white uh, lines between them. This is the brachial plexus of the patient. And if we were going to perform a supraclavicular block, this is how we would scan for it. And this is how we would do a supraclavicular block. Now, this is an overlay of the brachial plexus and the subclavian artery. Again, the very hyperechoic first rib. I'm going to take that away again so we could see that image as we first saw it. And this is going to be our landmark when we're starting to do an interscaling nerve block because once we see this, it's going to help us get to this because what we're going to end up doing is taking our probe, and I'm going to show you a video of this shortly, 
Your probe is going to start out here. Once you see that subclavian artery in the brachial plexus, you're going to gently slide the probe up the patient's neck and kind of flatten your probe up against the patient's neck so you're looking straight down. And while you're sliding up the patient's neck, you're going to look at that little bundle of grapes and you're going to see that little bundle of grapes turn into this snowman or stoplight. So this, this anechoic or black circle, C5, C6, C7, these three nerves are stacked up on top of each other. So that is what we're looking for when we're scanning and trying to do an interscaling nerve block. Now, uh, generally this is at the C6 vertebrae level, which correlates with the cricoid cartilage. Uh, here is the overlay of what that anatomy looks like. Again, C5, C6, and C7 is going to fall into this gap in between the middle scalene, which is lateral, and the anterior scalene, which is medial. Uh, we're also going to have our sternocleidomastoidus muscle uh, here on the medial side. Again, I'm going to take away that overlay here. Now once we see this, we're going to be bringing our needle in from that lateral side. We're going to puncture that skin. We're going to start advancing our needle in plane within the beam of the ultrasound. And we're going to be looking for that needle coming down. And we're going to angle that needle and we're going to go towards C7 with our needle. Now in our practice, we use a nerve stimulator uh, as, a, as a safety net. So what we'll do is we'll uh, set the nerve stimulator at 1.0 milliamps. We will start advancing our needle here going towards C7. Once we get close to C7, we're most likely going to see some type of twitching of the patient's arm, their shoulder, their forearm, uh, their biceps, their triceps. We're going to see some type of stimulation of the nerves. And once we see this, Whoever's helping us with the block will have them turn the nerve stimulator down until we see that twitch go away. What we're looking for is for that twitch to go away at greater than 0.3 milliamps. If you're still seeing twitches and your nerve stimulator is getting less than 0.3 milliamps, it is quite possible that your needle tip is intraneural. So you're going to want to reposition your needle tip turn the nerve stimulator back up and see where your twitches start and make sure that they have gone away at greater than 0.3 milliamps. Now I will tell you that sometimes I'm watching my needle in view on ultrasound and I get really close to C7 and I'm not getting, ner and I'm not getting twitches and that is okay. I will still, if I have a good view of my needle tip, I'll still inject my local anesthetic and I'll watch it spread around C7. I'll back up and inject around C6. I'll back up and inject around C5. But my nerve stimulator is connected and it's there if I need it for a um, just a safety precaution. So we recommend it. We know a lot of people don't use nerve stimulators, but we do uh, recommend using a nerve stimulator. Now here in this video, I'm going to show you that technique I described. Again, we're placing the probe over the clavicle. We're going to slide a little bit medial lateral until we see that pulsating subclavian artery. Once we see the subclavian artery, we look superior and lateral. We see this bundle of grapes. We see the hyperchoic first rib. We start sliding up the patient's neck. And as we do that, we have C5, C6, and C7 all nice and lined up. If you ever get lost, just slide right back down the patient's neck and go right back to that starting position with the subclavian artery, brachial plexus, and we slide right back up the patient's neck, C5, C6, C7. Now I also wanted to show you in this video this little black anechoic circle, circle here. That is the phrenic nerve, and I'm going to rewind this video to show you. Sorry about that. I'm going to rewind this video and show you. Um, so again, brachial plexus here, subclavian artery. As we slide up the neck, 
what I want you to look for, you're going to see this little anechoic circle right here. You see that circle moving towards the brachial plexus. And then as we slide back down, that little anechoic black circle moves away. That is the phrenic nerve traveling on top of that uh, anterior scalene muscle. So again, as we move up the neck, you're going to see this little black circle, anechoic circle, move towards C5, and that is the phrenic nerve. So here, um, I'm going to show you bringing the needle in from the lateral side. So once again, we're going to puncture the skin. We're going to go down, watching our needle in plane. We're going to come down around C7, make sure that we have uh, no nerve stimulation. Um, after we get, you know, we want to make sure we lose the nerve stimulator, uh, lose the twitches at uh, greater than 0 0.3 milliamps. And then we inject our local anesthetic. We're going to inject two cc's at a time. We're going to aspirate to make sure we're not uh, intravascular. You can see how the local anesthetic spreads to the medial side. We then back up our needle. We're going to kind of come over the top of C5 and inject a little bit of local anesthetic up here as well. Now I know that um, not all of our patients look like our models on BlockBuddy. Uh, we sometimes see patients like this. You really can't identify any particular anatomy in this neck, but I could tell you that, um, as I told you before, you take the pillow and you kind of push it away to give yourself some room here. I had this gentleman turn his head to the left side, and when he did that, it kind of stretched out his neck area and allowed me to get my probe in here and scan, and this guy's uh, interscaling nerve block was not that difficult once I got his head positioned and his neck stretched out a little bit. I know that these blocks can be very intimidating, but I could just recommend that you do them as much as possible. That's really the only way to get good at them. I also could say that if you haven't done these and you need to practice scanning, you might be able to recruit some of your coworkers, some of your colleagues that you work with. See if you could practice scanning them and just see if you could identify the relevant anatomy um, because really 99% of performing this block is identifying the relevant anatomy. So I do want to talk about some possible side effects and complications with an interscaling nerve block. Uh, larger volumes of local anesthetic may increase the spread of the local anesthetic within the neck and leading to recurrent laryngeal nerve block which will cause hoarseness or even Horner syndrome due to blockade of the stellate ganglion. That's why if we could decrease our volume as much as possible, we could reduce the um, possibility of these side effects. So we normally use 15 to 20 milliliters of local anesthetic. In the old days, uh, before ultrasound guidance, we were using 30 to 40 milliliters of local anesthetic in the interscaling nerve block. Now the phrenic nerve, is a bilateral mixed nerve that originates from the cervical nerves in the neck and descends through the thorax to innervate the diaphragm. It is the only source of motor innervation to the diaphragm and therefore plays a crucial role in breathing. Now for most patients, phrenic nerve block is not an issue, um, but please when you're educating the patient prior to doing the block, please warn them that it's a possibility that way if it occurs they're not completely surprised and um, people kind of get panicky if they're, if they're not made aware that when they wake up from their surgery, when they take a deep breath, they may have some weakness on that side and we just tell them it's completely normal. That's just a temporary weakness. It'll go away in a few hours. Now for patients with higher acuities, uh, obese patients, morbidly obese patients, patients with obstructive sleep apnea, smokers, COPDers, we do have some strategies to avoid phrenic nerve blockade. And going back to our anatomical drawings here, uh, we could see how the phrenic nerve is pretty close to C5, C6, and C7. And as I said before, as you go up higher in the neck, this phrenic nerve moves closer to C5. So um, one strategy is to kind of stay away from it 
and uh, do your block just a little bit lower in the neck and physically stay away from the phrenic nerve. So some strategies would be to, as I said, stay far away from it if possible. I will tell you that some people for shoulder surgeries will do a supraclavicular block, which does work quite well. Um, so that would be one way of, uh, it doesn't avoid the phrenic nerve completely because you could still get local anesthetic that spreads over to the phrenic nerve, but it is less likely with a supraclavicular block than it is with an inner scaling block. Or you can do, what I typically do is this block where I go, it's not a supraclavicular block and it's not an inner scaling block, but it's kind of in between. I'll start with that supraclavicular approach and I'll start sliding my probe up the patient's neck. And once I see those nerves kind of come together in a little cluster, then I'll perform my uh, block at that level. It's not a true interscaling block. It's a little bit lower, but I feel like that does decrease the amount of phrenic nerve blockade that I see. Also, I've said this before, using lower volumes of local anesthetic, 15 to 20 milliliters of local anesthetic, uh, seems to do the trick. We could also lower the concentration of our local anesthetic. Instead of using 0.5% Nerapin, we can go down to 0.3% Nerapin, and that will work just as well. Also, when we're doing our block with ultrasound guidance, we can physically visualize the local anesthetic on the lateral side of C5, C6, and C7, and try to avoid the spread of the local anesthetic to the medial side of those uh, three nerves. Another trick would be we can do an infraclavicular approach to the brachial plexus and block the lateral and posterior cords and then add a suprascapular block. These, block. these blocks are on Block Buddy Pro and you can see them, but if you were to have a very, very bad COPD and you wanted to completely avoid any possibility of a phrenic nerve blockade, you could perform these two blocks and you would ensure that you're not going to get a phrenic nerve block. So what if it happens, what do I do? Well, first I would try with some simple interventions and I would say most of the time the patient just needs a lot of coaching. Uh, sit them up as much as you can, put them in a chair, um, uh, encourage them to cough and deep breathe. Uh, you know, again, a lot of coaching, uh, try to tell them that they're okay. You would want to uh, wean the patient off of oxygen and see how they do off of the oxygen. Off of the oxygen, make sure they're not uh, getting tachypnic, uh, tachycardic, or, or or diaphoretic. So uh, just monitor the patient's symptoms, and I would say 99% of the time, some really good mental coaching goes a long way, and most patients do quite fine with it. Uh, now there's this other technique called normal saline washout. I have never done this, but it is in my back pocket, and I will explain that. There was an article in the Southern African Journal of Anesthesia and Analgesia, and basically they reversed phrenic nerve paresis uh, by doing a normal saline washout. So what happened is they did an interscaling nerve block on a patient. They used only eight milliliters of local, but they used a very concentrated local. They used 0.75% Nerapin. And what they did is they put the block in. When the patient had his rotator cuff repair, he was in a lateral position. So his surgical side was up. So naturally, the local anesthetic probably migrated more towards the medial side while the patient was asleep. And when he woke up, he was uh, uh, diaphoretic. He was tachypnic. He had tachycardia. He was satting in the low 90s on a 15, uh, 15 liter non rebreather mask. He was unable to talk in full sentences. Uh, so, what they did is they reperformed the interscaling block, but what they did is they injected 30 milliliters of uh, 0 0.9 preservative free normal saline. And when they did this, uh, the patient improved within 10 minutes and he was discharged from the PACU in 60 minutes. So basically what they did is they changed the concentration of ropivacaine from 0.75% to 0.16%. So they basically diluted their ropivacaine and the patient had an improvement of symptoms and the patient did, did well. So 
This is a little trick that you might want to keep in your back pocket if you were to ever to have someone that had uh, really bad symptoms from phrenic nerve block and you were worried about uh, their, their breathing status afterwards. Now, sometimes our patients, we do a nice interscaling nerve block and they wake up from their shoulder surgery and it hurts. So what are some of the things that, that we can do to assess that pain and to treat that pain? Um, well, we always can treat the patient conservatively. We can, um, depending how much pain they're having, we could administer a non-steroidal like Toradol or Caldolor. Uh, we can give them uh, IV acetaminophen. We can give small doses of ketamine, small doses of Presidex. Um, I mean, you could dig in your armentarium of medications and see if you could treat it that way. Um, if that doesn't work, what you could do is repeat your initial block. So you can go back and do your interscaling nerve block. But I will tell you that uh, for those of you that have performed these blocks in the PACU, they're very, very difficult. Uh, the patient's arm is in a sling. They have a big dressing on their shoulder. Uh, there's a lot of swelling in the area from the fluids uh, that get subcutaneously. Um, the patients aren't very cooperative. They have a hard time moving their head to the side. So it can be very difficult to, pre to repeat that initial block, but that is one way of treating that pain depending where that pain is. Now what I would say, what we commonly see in our practice is if they're having pain post-op, it's usually the supraclavicular nerves were missed somehow. So the supraclavicular nerves innervate this upper area of the shoulder and there's usually a port site right here on the anterior side. So if that's where the patient's pain is, then you could repeat that initial interscaling block or you can go back and do a intermediate um, cervical plexus block. And I'm going to talk about that here in the next slide. So for an intermediate cervical plexus block, we could see here that the supraclavicular nerves actually come off of the, of the um, cervical plexus here. And the cervical plexus comes out from just underneath the sternocleidoid mastoid muscle. Uh, right here about at the level of C4, which correlates with the notch of the thyroid cartilage. So you will see in some older textbooks, um, uh, CRNAs or anesthesiologists is taking a syringe with 6 to 7 milliliters of local anesthetic and going at the level of C4, going just lateral and popping that needle underneath the sternocleidoid mastoid muscle and, and fanning out about 5 to 7 milliliters of local anesthetic. But I'm going to tell you with ultrasound, this block is very, very easy. So what we do is we take our high frequency uh, linear probe and we go up a little bit higher in the neck than where we were with our inner scaling block. So again, we go at the uh, about level with the notch of the thyroid cartilage, which correlates with C4. So we're up a little bit higher in the neck. And we're going to place the probe right on top of the sternocleidoid mastoid muscle. So that's the muscle here that we can see. And what we're going to do is just kind of slide the probe a little bit lateral. And as we slide lateral, we're going to see the sternocleidoid mastoid muscle kind of thin out. And then just underneath it is this fascia, just underneath it. What we're going to do is bring our needle in from the lateral side. We're going to pop underneath this fascia. We're going to inject about 5 to 7 milliliters of local anesthetic just underneath this fascia. And in this, in this plane underneath the fascia, we have the nerves of the um, cervical plexus here. And this is what the overlay of that anatomy looks like. And when we bring our needle in from that lateral side, we're going to want to use a short needle, 50, mil, 50 millimeter needle. We're going to come in very, very flat. This is very superficial. We're going to pop that needle in and then inject our 5 to 7 milliliters of local anesthetic. And this will capture those uh, supraclavicular nerves, which innervate that um, anterior part of the shoulder, which is commonly, I wouldn't say commonly missed, but it is sometimes missed when you do your interscaling nerve block. Once again, my name is Jeff Malter, CRNA with BlockBuddy Pro. If you think of any questions, please send me an email, jeff at myblockbuddy.com. You could also check out our website for the BlockBuddy app at myblockbuddy.com. 
Thank you so much for participating in the Treasure Island fundraiser for the a and Foundation. Your money is going to a great cause. Thank you very much, everyone, and, and have a great day.